Yes. Yeah. Well, the, um, this is Georgia O'Keeffe in different uh, different stages. Um, she was born in 18, 1887 and died in 1986, so she died age 99. She had a had a good innings, as they say, um, but not in America, <laughs> which is where she come, came from. She was, is mainly known for her paintings of um, very much enlarged flowers, kind of that go over from realism to hyperrealism to whatever. Um, also, skyscrapers and 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 especially the New Mexico landscapes, which I really like. <laughs> And she has she's been called the mother of American modernism. Um, so she was born in, in Wisconsin in a farmhouse. Her parents were um, her, I think her mother was an O'Keefe and um, her father. Sorry, her father was uh, of Irish descent, but her, her mother was of um, Hungarian descent. Her grand grandfather was called George Victor Toto, and um, Georgia O'Keeffe's middle name is Georgia Toto O'Keeffe. And he was apparently a Hungarian count who came to the States in 1848. She was always from the start. She was um, apparently she was quite ill from influenza. When do you think that was? <laughs> 1920s the great pandemic of which you know which yeah, we're my grandfather prepared. died in that really mm -hmm. right right which killed an estimated 20 million people world, worldwide i think the the current pandemic might begin to rival that um eventually um but she because she was ill she took leave from a teaching position at um uh, uh, west texas college and recuperated at a friend's, friend's ranch in San Antonio, where she painted the flag, which you can see on the left. It's um, you've seen as a bit. Of, this is a description of it as a red streak bleeding into bruise-coloured clouds. She wrote she felt compelled to paint from a sense of necessity. Her image was of a flag floating in the wind, similar to a tremble. So, uh, and uh, one author suggests. She sets a drooping flag against a starless, darkening sky. It flutters, stripped of its stars and stripes. Its only colour and that of the pole is blood red. And apparently her, her older brother, uh, called Alexis, was severely gassed in France during the First World War and eventually died from the effects um, a few years later. And she was very much anti-war and very much a, an early feminist as well. She, you know, she always dressed in nearly always dressed in blacks and whites. Uh, but it wasn't shown for a long time because uh, anti-war sentiment in the States was criminalized. I didn't know of that with the Espionage Act of 1917. So any anti-war protest was seen as actually illegal and um, you could get arrested for it. So it, it never got shown till much, much later. So this is one of her earliest paintings. Is that watercolour or is yes, it oil? It, 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 it was a watercolour, yes, you're right, yes. Yeah. So it's watercolour, yes. Yeah. I, I wish Gordon could see these and... Uh... <laughs> Why? Has he gone? Well, he, he can do because it's being recorded, so... Ah, good point, good point, yeah. Bill. These are a series of uh, charcoal on paper drawings, which I don't myself find particularly attractive. I don't know why. Maybe it's just because it's charcoal. But um, it's but there's, a, there's some... a lot of there's a lot of movement there, though. There is, isn't there? And they were seen there's, as very much as, depth, uh, as, depth as a movement. In, innovative abstractions. But whereas uh, you know people were becoming aware of the trends in in France and uh, the Europe at the time of abstract art and people using abstract art often copied the cubist, the more kind of square type of drawings that Picasso was fond of doing, but she, um, she didn't, she, she, she used sort of rhythms and shapes to what she said she called the unknown to dictate her compositions. So she developed these radical charcoal drawings and, um, the event eventually led her to, to embracing abstraction. Just to give a, 
a, a, a typical art historian's view on this. The, the one on the left is, is seen as a, a rising flame, flame or flowing river suggested by the curved lines on the right side. On the left is a jagged line that seems to represent a lightning strike or mountains in between the two or four rounded images that appear to be trees or a rolling hillside. Well, I'm pretty impressed by somebody seeing all that in it. I didn't see it myself, but you can in a way. It's, it's a valid interpretation of them. I saw it as a group of four people, one behind the other, yes. going through what I thought were mountains and a river. But yeah. <laughs> that's, that's just that's, what I saw. Well, that's per perfectly as valid as the other interpretation, I think. And seeing that, that she painted... middle one, that, <clears throat> sorry. Go on. That yeah. upper middle one looks like somebody's hemorrhoids to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I well, we it... haven't, I haven't examined any recently, but... <laughs> They, they they come later if I've now re, I've now remembered who she is and why I, why I remember her but that that comes later Lorraine right they look a bit anatomical to me but that one on the right looks like a dove um I yeah it, it, with it an looked, apple with an almost, apple or it could be a baby with a different shape but I, again I think they, they are a bit a of wing. The one in the bottom looks like it's got a toffee apple or something, an upside down toffee apple in it. But um, I don't think that interpretation is a very good one. Um, but at this time, she met a, um, a New York art dealer called Alfred Stieglitz, who held an exhibition of her works. And he then suggested that she move to New York and begin work, working seriously as an artist. Then you can guess what happened. They developed a professional relationship and a personal relationship. Um, they eventually got married in 1924 because he was already married at the time. So not quite as sensational as Picasso or, um, <laughs> or Freud or Lucian Freud, but um, the artists seem to, to um, often have very complex personal lives, don't they? lifestyles. Those all seem very depressive to me, those dark charcoal pictures. Well, th this is when she she moved into um, painting flowers. And she, she, as you can see, it's like a very much a magnified flower. And this is called Jimson Weed White Flower Number no. One, 1932. It sold in 2014 for over 44 million dollars, and I think she's still the highest selling woman in art. So I, I think that it is a really nice painting. That one, I really like it. It's beautiful. Mm. How, how big is it in real life? Ooh, good is, question. Yeah. Don't know. I don't think it's huge, but it's uh, it's, it's probably bigger than represented on your screen. It looks like bindweed, doesn't it? Yes, I was thinking that. Morning because, glory. Well, may, maybe maybe Jimson weed is a bit like the American version of that. I don't know. It, you're yeah, quite maybe. right. It does. It does. It's beautiful. But what, what she said about it, she it said it was her mission to highlight the complex structure of flowers, explaining when you take a flower in your hand and really look at it, it's your world for the moment. I want to give that world to someone else. And I think that's true. You know, we, we do see a lot of beauty in flowers. Though in terms of art movements, it's definitely seen as a secondary one to painting people. Yeah. As is also painting animals. Mm. Oh, this is a red poppy, an earlier one. So they're kind of, this is a, she started ma making near abstract versions of flowers as well. Flowers, shells, plants. And because this one, it's, uh, the, the red is, a, red and black is really luminous in it, in it. And again, somebody else's comments, gives the impression of light forms floating in space. These ev shapes evoke natural forms of leaves seen in extreme close-up. She was especially well known for painting irises. And do you know why she was, why was she well known for that? Because she, she painted, painted irises. irises. <laughs> <laughs> in tandem, Dave, there you were, in unison, mate. <laughs> Thank you for that very profound thought. Fantastic. <laughs> because they, uh, they were appropriated by feminists and uh, considered to be a highly uh, stylized representation of female genital organs. Correct. They were um, 
Well, was, they were described as overtly sexual symbolism of the lim, uh, of the lily, which was exploited by several uh, important modernists, including somebody who I won't be featuring, but let's go for that, Salvador Dali. Ah. From his his book called the the face of the great this is the the face of the great masturbator 1929 in typical salvador <laughs> dali dali style so oh. let's go i'll go, go to the previous one so quite a lot of it quite a lot of them would do that and of course with freud's psychoanalysis rampant at the time there there have been repeated feminist interpretations of the um uh of this flower indeed which I, I, I like. I, I love the colours in it. I think it's really nice one. This. Yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. I like. Something else that she became um, famous for were especially because she she used to for, for most summers after a certain point in the career, she went to in the summers to New Mexico. The um, who I think it's become familiar to me through um, Breaking Bad. You remember the TV series, the, the sort of New Mexico landscapes. But she, she'd, she'd wander around and pick up things like this, which is um, a, a weathered cow's skull. What do you think it looks like? A cross. Yes. A sacri sacrificial cross. That's yeah. right. Male dominance and potency. Reminds <laughs> me of the cover of the Rolling Stones uh, album, Sticky Fingers. <laughs> Well, um, well, you could say that it looks like a womb with... Um, yeah. Yes, yes. A no, I agree with that. So she, she was trying to make a point about what... There was, there, was a, there was a talk at this time in the 20s and 30s about things like the great American novel. And um, they're also thinking in terms of what sort of art would best symbolise America. And she gave this as her interpretation, which... Um, has really become one of the icons of the American West, really, when you think about it, the, from cowboy films and whatever. And it's also, it also, it includes the three colours of the American flag behind the school, if you think about it. So that was her cow skull, and she'd done loads of these. She'd done a lot of these as well. This is somewhere else. She, um, because she, she lived with Stieglitz, who came from a very rich family they they had quite um quite a leisurely lifestyle really they're often going to really nice places this was his um i think they had a summer house Stieglitz family near lake george which i'd never heard of but it's apparently a big one north of new york somewhere and this is a, a painting at a, a painting of the lake at dusk and she was removed the shoreline el eliminating all details and sort of distilling the mountains and lake scenery to its most elemental forms. So again, this is seen as a moving between the descriptive and the abstract by making a mirrored image of the mountain. I think that's but lovely. Also, it's often put forward um, vertically rather than horizontally. Because it, it, it looks different, maybe it looks more sexual then, I don't know. But it's um, it's seen as, I should have put a version of it like that, but I haven't done it. You're going to have to twist your heads if you want to look at yeah. it. But it. It is, I think some of the paintings at this time, I've done some more of them now, are lovely. This is wow. Lake George, and that, again, it's beautiful. as you, you can yeah. imagine from my liking of that um, Matisse, I think it was, that you didn't like that much, Jackie. I like those those reds and oranges and yellows, I, I think they're, I think they're lovely. I love the autumn colours, but I find that the previous painting, I think the colours are very soothing and restful, whereas these are more angry. Although I love autumn, so I shouldn't. Uh, yeah, yeah, they, I think you're right. And that's probably what attracts me to it as well. The, uh, but it, again, it's slightly, if you like, it's a bit, more on the abstract side than the the painting before but i mm, think this is a yeah. this is a really good one and there you can see another style of painting it um oh golly which Ooh, is <laughs> which is an earlier one but it, it look it somehow seems very modern very kind of pop artish somehow doesn't it the colors yeah 
Yeah. The hemorrhoids again. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's a bit obsessed here, Lorraine. It, it seems very art deco to me, that rather than. All oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Because it, yes. I, I love the images of the mountains, though, and the way it gives the depth of it at the top. It's like it's a cool. mirror image, isn't it? It's, yeah. 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 Well, it's, that's what it's called, Lake George it's Reflection. Like Interesting. Oh. Pelvis with the, with the distance. distance. Oh, that's yeah. weird. And that it was uh, around about this time there was. Um, an exhibition that year in MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, which features a lot in any discussion of American paintings. Um, and the, the term magical realis realism, which Salvador Dali and, and co made sort of famous at this time, this, there was also a kind of a, a tendency towards that in American art of a kind of merging of American realism and magic realism. Um, this is what she said about it. When I started painting the pelvis bones, I was most interested in the holes in the bones, what I saw through them, particularly the blue from holding them up against the sky. They were the most beautiful thing against the blue, that blue that will always be there as it is now. <laughs> Not if you live in Manchester, it won't. Um, after all <laughs> man's destruction is finished. Whether you succeed, succeed or not is irrelevant. There is no such thing. Making your unknown known is the most important thing and keeping the unknown always beyond you. That sounds a bit like that, those famous quotes about the known unknown and the unknown unknown. <laughs> Somebody else's vision will never be as good as your own vision of yourself. Live and die with it because at the end it's all you have. Lose it and you lose yourself and everything else. I should have listened to myself. Well, it's, um, there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Bernard. Oh. That's great. <laughs> a lot, of, a lot of influence from Dali there. With without the, without the, the, the serene finish that he has to. Yes, he's a very kind of naturalistic yeah, but... objects in very unnatural situations, aren't they? Yeah. These are. They, oh, that's a picture of a carrying bones, <laughs> which he's obviously very keen on doing. And you can see the, um, the the images that she's made from her time in New Mexico, which I think is, it, she, she traveled there a lot. Uh, first went there in 1929. So she was trying oh, wow. to balance the, the extremes of the American temperaments, avoiding photographic realism. Because I suppose as photography got more and more popular, the more realist art began to question whether that was the way best way forward for art and that's where I think a lot of the abstraction came in and but particularly she like the one in the bottom right hand corner there in the four paint it's, it's lovely isn't it it, lo it, it looks almost that's um, gorgeous like muscles yeah, it, or something. It, yeah it, you can you can see the kind of uh, confliction between realism and you know impressionism that it's kind of yeah yeah beautiful it's colors beautiful, and right. graded colors beautiful. Mm. But, uh, but unlike a lot unlike a lot of artists she, or to artists she there weren't any particular extremes or violence in the you know no brutal impact like you saw in some of the the other artists like even like last week with um lucian freud's painting the first painting i showed of the benefits supervisor it was quite a shock to some people i think or to, to anybody who saw it first time so it's more contemplative contemplative and more spiritual. Mm. That's, I think that's a, a terrific photo. She's quite an impressive lady, isn't she? Don't you think? Yeah. 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 She, it, that's yeah, out right. of the quirky in New Mexico, in 1960. She's standing at her easel outdoors, adjusting a canvas, canvas from her pelvis series, <laughs> red with yellow. Pelvis <laughs> paint. <laughs> Yeah. She, as she said about this, a flower is relatively small. Everyone has many associations with a flower. You put your hand to touch it, lean forward to smell it, maybe touch it with your lips almost without thinking, or give it to someone to please them. Still, in a way, nobody sees a flower really. It's so small, we haven't time. And to see takes time, like to have a friend take time. 
If I could paint the flower exactly as I see it, no one would see what I see because I would paint it small like the flower is small. So I said to myself, I'll paint what I see, what the flower is to me, but I'll paint it big and they will be surprised into taking time to look at it, which is an interesting explanation, isn't it? For why she did um, very large versions of her flowers. But I, I think I think they're really, really nice paintings. By the way, there she is in a typical black and well, is that more like brown dress, isn't it? But she mm -hmm. um, she made nearly all her own clothes. She was a brilliant seamstress, apparently. Oh. Um, mm. This is from ex an exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum in 2017, and it compared the sweep of her own cloak there to the Brooklyn Bridge painting that's there on the left. She, as I said, she wore black and white almost exclusively. She rejected corsets and heels in favour of tunics and flat shoes. Even when she was a young girl, she said, I'm not going to I'm not going not going that way. She refused to accept what the norm was. She once announced to her classmates, I'm going to live a different life from the rest of you girls. I'm going to give up everything for my art. That's when she was a young girl. <laughs> she's, wearing a billy cup. she's wearing a billy cup now too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice link, Graham. Nice link. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now getting on to the thing that I'm always interested in as well is the personal life of um, of artists and a, a lot of photographs were taken by Alfred Stieglitz who, who's who in his own right is quite a famous photographer um, so she moved in 1918 to New York he provided with a studio uh, and uh, within a month he was taking the first of many nude photographs of her not surprisingly, they married later on, um, <laughs> after he managed to get his divorce from his, his first wife. Um, his wife suspected that he was uh, something was going on between the two. I don't think it would have taken much working out that one uh, and told him to stop seeing her or get out. He left home immediately and found a place in the city where he and O'Keefe could live together. Um, they married in once his divorce came through in 1924 and he died in 1946. Um, there again, in 1933, she, um, uh, O'Keefe was hospitalized for two months after suffering a nervous breakdown, mainly because of his, his affair with Dorothy Norman, uh, a married woman who was but very much younger than him. And that affair continued on and off until his death. So O'Keefe tended to spend her summers in New Mexico, but she still continued to see Stieglitz in New York in the winter. But when in 1946, when she went off to New Mexico, Stieglitz suffered a cerebral thrombosis. She immediately flew back to New York to be with him. And um, he died that year and she buried his ashes at Lake George. In 1973, though, she um, recruited a, a, a John Hamilton as a living assistant. He was a potter who had been recently divorced and was broke. He was 58 years her junior. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good going. Um, yeah. <laughs> he was really good for her and he, he, he got her to resume painting despite her deteriorating eyesight and helped her to write her autobiography and worked with her for 13 years. She became increasingly frail in, in the 1990s um, and sorry, and she died in, sorry, in the eight, in her 90s and she died in March 1986. Now, has anybody, has anybody seen this before? No. No, that's interesting. That's super. It's um, by Mary Beth Edelson, some living American women artists. The Last Supper. So what's she basing it on then? <laughs> Anybody got an idea of what Da painting? Vinci's Last Supper? Our Last Virgin. Supper. That's right. Our it's, da Vinci. That, it was Da Vinci, the, the, the da one that was done on the wall. The Last Supper, Vitera, yeah. Yeah. And you can see who's in the centre of it. But Georgia O'Keeffe. Mm. So she's seen. Wow. So she's seen as a uh, it, it addresses the role of religious and art historical iconography 
in the subordination of women become, becoming one of the most iconic images of the feminist art movement. So there you go. When was that done? When was that done? 1972. Ah, oh, right. Is that Yoko Ono on the far right or is, or is that somebody else? I can't tell. It looks like her, doesn't it? Could be. No, I don't think so. No, I don't think, I don't think she's, so. She's not American, is she? Good yeah, point. Um, well, maybe if you live there long enough, you become American. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Because yeah. I was thinking Frida Kahlo doesn't appear to be there, but she was Mexican anyway. She was Mexican, yeah. 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 I, don't, I can't recognise any of the others, actually. The most famous ones, presumably, are sitting at the table, but I can't. Oh, you, you mean, was the one right at the right of the table? Yeah. Was that, she, it does look like Oh, there, on, yes. Yeah. I thought you meant the one like right your... at the bottom. It does look like you, oh, quite right. That is, yeah, that's definitely her. I look, think it it's... is, yeah. It looks very much Yes. Like I was thinking the one in the bottom corner, yeah, but no, you're right. That's interesting. So that's Georgia O'Keeffe. 